Let me begin by a question and indulge me on this a little bit. Do you remember where you were last year when you first heard that humanity had finally beaten the Turing test? This is what I'm talking about. This was in May of, of last year. I think I've, most of you have probably seen this, but let's, let's take a, a quick look at it. This is a demonstration of the Google Assistant talking with a shop owner who does not know they're talking to a machine. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So this was May of last year, and I was actually there in the audience. This was Google I.O. And I had been aware of developments in NLP, in Natural Language Processing. Uh, I knew what a lot of these systems were capable of, but I was really shocked upon seeing this. I had no idea that we were this close to this. And for a second, I, I felt, wait, does, does this constitute beating the, the Turing test? And in reality, it does not. This is a constrained Turing test. The, the actual test is, is you know, a lot more difficult, but it's a really good preview of that, how that will ultimately sound like. Um, so this is called Google Duplex, and I don't believe we have a paper on it, on how it works, uh, but we have a blog post about it. And in the beginning and in the end, you have text-to-speech and, and speech-to-text. To, uh, um, and that's the kind of technology you've used maybe with Siri, with Alexa, with, with Google Assistant. But I think a lot of the magic happens here in the middle. Um, we can t call these in general maybe sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, um, which would take words, and they would take them in the form of embeddings, uh, which are vectors, which is the topic of the, of the talk, which is basically just a list of numbers. Um, and then they would do the calculation and, uh, and, and do the rest. Duplex is only one manifestation of a number of natural language processing systems um, that are, you know, they keep developing super fast. This is a picture of how Google Translate works. This is from a paper back in 2016. Um, to break it down into the major components, you would put the input words, uh, you would turn them into embeddings, and that's how you'd feed it to the model. So models deal with word or understand words um, as vectors. In this case, the embeddings are actually of parts of word. So playing would have, play would have its own embedding and then ing would have its own embedding. And then Google Translate does an encoding step and a decoding step and it, it outputs uh, words in, in the other language. So these Models have been developing at a pace that is, that is you know, tremendous. We use them every day in our phones, in our computers when we type. It's like we and the machines are, are you know, we're depending on them so much that we're starting to complete each other's sentences. It's not perfect, uh, but it's, it's developing pretty quickly. Think about the open AI GPT-2 that was published two months, uh, about a month ago, that was capable of writing tremendous essays. This is one example of it going on a rant about how recycling is bad. And you can easily see this, you know, I can easily compare this to, you know, uh, comments I've seen on Reddit or on Facebook. You know, there's a lot of conviction behind this. And a lot of this, we, we wouldn't think that it was generated by, by machines. So this is another example. Um, so we have a number of, of NLP systems and models that are continu continuing to do amazing things. And a lot of it is in you know, just the last 12 months. 
Uh, these are some of the examples. And right now, we're looking at these technologies that are enabling us to understand the complexity of language. And we're saying, hmm, maybe there's a way to use this for, for, to solve other complex problems, to find pattern in other sequences of data that we might have. So the main concept that we're, we're going to extract out of all of these models is the concept of embeddings. We'll have three sections in the talk. We'll talk a little bit about you know, an introduction, how embeddings are, are generated, and then we'll talk about uh, using them for recommendation engines outside of NLP. And then we have a, a lucky number 13 uh, ominous section ominously called consequences, and I hope we have enough time to get there. As you've seen maybe from the first slide, I'm using the, the, the Dune sequence of six novels as, as the theme, so there are going to be quotes here and there. My name is J.L. Amar. I blog here and I tweet there. Um, I've written a couple of uh, introductions to machine learning. I've written a recap about the developments in natural language processing. Uh, the most popular post on my blog is the Illustrated Transformer, which illustrates the, uh, the neural network architecture called the Transformer, which actually powers the OpenAI GPT-2. It powers the BERT model uh, shown here. It powers DeepMind's Alpha Star, which plays StarCraft II, like, you know, a complex strategy game, and it was able to beat professional players. But I also have some introductory uh, posts there as well. I've created videos uh, working with Udacity for the machine learning nano degree program and the deep learning nano degree program. Uh, in the day, I'm a VC. Uh, we're the biggest venture capital fund in, uh, in the Middle East. And from that perspective, I try to think about these algorithms and how they apply to products. Uh, and you'll see some of the examples here. Of We're going to talk about the algorithms, but we'll also talk about products and how that sort of uh, reflects on, on products. Let's begin with a uh, simple analogy, just to get into the mood about talking about how things can be represented by vectors. Do you know these online personality tests that you know, can ask you a few questions and then tell you something about yourself? Not silly ones like this, but maybe more like the MBTI that would tell you something about uh, it would score you on like four different axes. Uh, more commonly used is something like the big five personality traits. That's more uh, accepted maybe in, in psychology circles. Uh, you can take a test like that and it would rate you on, on each of these five uh, axes. It would give you a score saying how, it would really tell you a lot about yourself. One way you can take this is this uh, 538 page. So you can go on there, you will, uh, they will ask you 30 multiple choice questions, and then they will give you five scores uh, along these different uh, axes. And they will tell you uh, some things about your personality, some that psychologists have been, have been studying for you know, tens of years. These five scores, and then they, they show you this graph, and then they show you how it compares to the national average and, and to the Taylor staffers, and you can send it around to your friends and compare. Um, so you can, you can take this after, after the... So this is a form, let's say, of embedding. So this is my actual, maybe, score along one of these axes. So I would score 38 on the extroversion, which means I'm closer to the introversion. I thought I would be closer, but uh, you know, I'm near the middle. So that's one number that tells you one thing about my personality. <coughs> let's switch the uh, range from zero to, from zero to 100 down to minus one to one, just so we can think about them more as vectors. Now, this doesn't tell you a whole lot about me. It's one number, it tells you one axis of my personality, but then you need a, a lot more numbers to, to actually be able to represent a person. So let's take trait number two, and I'm not saying which trait that is, um, because we need to get used to not knowing what the vectors represent. And so that vector would kind of look like this. Now, assume that maybe before coming here today, I was not uh, paying attention and I got run over by a big red bus. Uh, let's say QCon needs to replace me very quickly. There are two people. These are their personalities, assuming they know just as much about the topic uh, as I do. Um, which one has the closer personality? 
we, this is an easy problem. Linear algebra gives us the tools. So we have similarity measures that we can compare vectors. So the commonly used one is, is cosine similarity, and then we give it the two vectors. It would give us two scores, and we'd get the one with the, more score, with the, with the higher score. But then, again, two numbers is also not enough. You need more numbers to actually, psychology thought, you know, they call them big five because these five uh, tell you something about it. But some of these tests would give you maybe 20 or 30 even uh, scores or, or axes. The thing is, when you, we go beyond two or three dimensions, we lose the ability to draw things, plot things as vectors. And this is a common challenge with machine learning. We always have to jump really quickly into higher dimensional space. Uh, and we lose the ability to visualize things. But the good thing is, our tools still work. We can still do cosine similarity with however number of dimensions that we have. So two ideas I want to emerge from this section. First, you can represent people, you can represent things by vectors of number, an array of floats, if, if you may. Uh, which is great for machines. Machines need numbers to do calculations, and they're very good at, uh, at that. And then two, once you have these vectors, you can easily compare the similarity between one or two or three or a hundred. You can easily say customers who like J also liked, and then rate by similarity, and then just sort. And you can see where I'm going with this. But before we get into recommendations, let's talk about word embeddings. So we said with people, you can give people a questionnaire and learn about their personality. You can't do that with words. The guiding principle here is that words that occur next to each other, we can infer a lot of information from that. We will look at how the training process works. But first, let's look at an actual trained uh, word vector, which is this. This is the uh, word vector for the word, this is a word vector for the word kink. This is a glove, so there are a number of uh, different algorithms. This is a glove representation. It's in 50 uh, floats. Uh, it's trained on Wikipedia in a, another data set, and you can download this data set, and it has 400,000 words. King is one of them. The thing is, that, you, know, you can't really, by glancing, you can't tell a lot. There's a lot of you know, numbers and precision, so I wanted to have a more visual representation. So I was like, okay, let's, okay, this is, okay, these should be white boxes. Um, so I said, let's put them on just one row, but then let's also color them. So these numbers are all between two and minus two. So the closer they are to two, the more red they will be. The closer they are to minus two, the more blue they would be. And if they're in the center, they would be, let's say, white. And so this is one way that you can look at a, at a vector. This is the, the, the word vector for king. All right, let's look at some more examples. Can you find any patterns here? King, man, and woman. Comparing them, you can see that you know, between man and woman, there are a few things that are a lot more similar than maybe man to king. These embeddings have, have captured something about the meanings of these words, and they tell you about, about the, the, similar, the similarities between them. We can go one step further and say, I you know, have this gradient for you where, okay, queen, then woman and girl. And you can say between woman and girl, there's a lot more similarities than the rest. Between girl and boy, you can see these two blue ones that aren't uh, available in, in the rest. Could these be coding for youth? We don't know. But there are similarities captured in the word vector where there are similarities in the meanings that we perceive of. And I put water there in the, in the end, so you can see that, okay, all of the ones above are people. This is an object. How does that uh, do anything, does anything sort of break? You can see that red line goes all the way through, but then that blue line breaks when you get to, to, uh, to the object, let's say. The most, one of the more interesting ways to explore these relationships is uh, analogies. And we can say, this is the famous example from, from word to vec which is if you have the, the word vector for the word king, you subtract man and add woman, what would you get? Queen. Exactly. So two things. You would get a vector that's very close to queen. Uh, this is the GenSim library for Python, G-E-N-S-I-M. Uh, you can use it to download a um, you know, pre-trained vector. And you can say, okay, 
add king and woman, and then subtract man, what are the most similar vectors around this, this resulting vector? And it would be queen, and this would be the similarity score between it. And, and so by a large margin, uh, it's more similar than any other word from the 400,000 words that the model knows. And when I first read this, I was a little bit suspicious. I was, I was like, does it equal it exactly? And it doesn't equal it exactly. So these are the three words. This is the resulting uh, vector. And then this is the, the closest vector. But it will be the, the closest vector to it. It wouldn't equal it exactly, but it's, you know, it's, it's approximated. It's the closest vector from, from the space. Uh, this is another way to represent the analogies. You can say France is to Paris as Italy is to, and you have the answer there, it's to Rome. So that's it's really powerful, but we, we've knew all of this since like 2013, 14, I guess. These examples are from the Word to Vec uh, paper here, and they have this visual of, so they run, their embeddings are 300 dimensions, they shrink them down into two dimensions using PCA, and then you would find the countries would be on the left, the capital cities would be on the right, and there'd be, be very similar distances between the countries and the, and the, and the cities, and the capital cities. To talk a little bit about, about history and how, um, how word vectors came about, we need to talk about language modeling. When I try to think of an example to give somebody of an NLP system, the first thing I think of is Google Translate. But there are better examples. There are examples that we use tens or hundreds of times every day. Our smartphones, they're keyboards that predict the next word for us. That is a language model. How do they work? I've had a hand wavy idea about, okay, so it scanned a lot of text and sort of it has probabilities and statistics, but Let's, take, let's you know, take a look at how, how they would really work. Uh, let's assume that we shape the problem as um, it would take two words as input and then would output the third uh, word as its prediction. Let's, we can think about it like this. This is a model, let's call it a black box for now. It would take two words as input and would output a, would output a third word and with the task, of, uh, the task of predicting the next word. So this is a very high level view. It doesn't, you know, the model is still a black box. We'll, we'll slice it into layers. So the next layer is to say, if we consider the initial uh, neural network uh, language models, they would not output to you one word. They would out output to you a vector. The length of this vector is the length of you know, the vocabulary that your model has. So if your model knows 10,000 words, it would give you a vector of 10,000 values. Each value is a score for how likely or probable that word is to be that, uh, the output. And so if this model is gonna output the word not, it would assign the highest probability to the uh, index in that vector associated with the word not. Now, how does the model actually generate its uh, prediction? The first, it does it in three steps. The first step is really what we care about the most in when we're talking about embeddings. So, it has the word thou and shalt. So the first things it will do is to say, give me, it would look up the embeddings of the words thou and shalt. And it would do that from a matrix of embeddings that was generated during the training process. And then these would be handed over to be, you know, to calculate a prediction, which is basically multiplying by a, a matrix or passing it through a layer, a neural network layer, and then projecting it to the, to the uh, library. And then, the details of this model is in this uh, Bengio paper from uh, 2003. So these are the early, this is just a look at how a predicted, uh, how, a, how a trained model would make a prediction. But then we also need to know how was it trained in the first place. The, the amazing thing about um, language models is that we can, train them on running text. We have a lot of text out there in the world. That's not the case with a lot of other machine learning tasks where you have to have features that were you know, handcrafted 
we have a lot of text in Wikipedia. We have books, we have news articles, we have a tremendous amount of text. So if there's a task that can be trained on just running text, that's incredible. And that's what we saw with you know, something like the, the GPT-2, which was trained on 40 gigabytes of text crawled over the internet just from Reddit. Uh, so there's no shortage of, of text. So language models, that's an attractive feature of, of language models. So let's say we have an untrained model that would take two words and output a word. We'd throw Wikipedia at it. How, how is that training uh, you know, prepared? So we have sort of our articles. We have extracted text out of them. We basically have a window that we slide over the text, and that window extracts a, a training, let's say, uh, data set. We can use this quote from, from Dune again. Um, to look at an example of how that window is, is processed. So window is beyond the first three words. We have the first two words in the left. They would be the inputs and then, uh, or they, we can call them features to our, our data set. And then the third word would be the, the, the label or, or output. We slide our window. We have another example. We slide our window. We have a third. And then we have, we have you know, 40 gigabytes of text. We'd have an incredibly long uh, table. Now, if I ask you this question, and you have a little bit more context. So a model might know, might only be able to see the previous two words or the previous three words. You can see the previous five words. And you have a little bit of context from earlier in the, in the, in the, in the speech, in the talk. So, what would you put in the uh, bus, right? Car is, is also a good. Uh, so is it bus? What if I give you two more words on the right side of that word? It would be red, right? But then you didn't know that. That information on the right was not given to you. And there is value in that. The, the context, you have to look at both. There's information on both left side and the right side. So if we use them in the training or when you create our embeddings, there, there would be, uh, there's value in that. One of the most important ideas in, in these um, models is called skip gram. So we said, okay, let's look at the two words previous and the two words after the, the word that we're guessing. And two is a random number. You can have it as five. Five is more often used. You can have it as, as 10. So that's a hyperparameter that you can change based on the data set. And, but let's look at two. So how would we go about generating the, the, this kind of data set that looks both sides? We'd say, OK, red is our label. The two words before it and the two words after it are our features. And so our model would look, or our data set would look like this. We have our four features and an output. And this is, what's, this is what's called a CBAO, continuous bag of words model. Uh, so it's, it's, it's widely used, but one that is even more widely used is called SkipGram. And it, it flips things around and does things a little bit differently than, than continuous bag of words. It says, I will use the current word to predict neighboring words. But the thing is, with every time you slide that window, you don't generate just one example. You generate four, or however many your, your windows are. Uh, so you would be able to, you know, uh, or the goal of, of the model is to predict by, if it was given the word red, also uh, a or bus. So with every time we slide that model, we have, we have four or however many our, our windows is like. So let's look at an, at an example of, of sliding that. Uh, thou shalt not make a, and then not is the word we're focusing on now. Uh, we'd have four examples. We slide our uh, window, we have four more examples. And then you go along the text, and then you create a lot of examples. And then we have our data set, and then we're ready to sort of train our model against. Uh, and this is, this is, you can think about this about, you know, as a virtual way. You don't need to tra train the model in this sequence, but this is a cleaner way to think about it, is that you extract the data set first, and then you train the model against it. So it's, it makes a, a bit more sense if you think of it uh, that way. So we go over our first model. We give our feature to the model. 
We say, okay, and the model is not trained, it's randomly initialized. We say, okay, do the three things. Look up embeddings, and it, it has garbage embeddings. They're you know, randomly initialized. Uh, it hasn't been trained to do anything. And the predictions and, and the projection are not gonna work well, when we know that. So it would output a, just a random uh, word. But the thing is, we know what word we were expecting. We were expecting thou. We were like, okay, no, you outputted this, but this is the actual target that we want. This is the difference, so this is the error in how much uh, your prediction was off. And that error we feed back to the model. So we update our embedding uh, matrix, we update our two other matrices, uh, and the model learns from the errors. And that nudges the model at least one step into becoming a trained, or a, a, better, um, a better model. And then we do that with the rest of the, and that's just you know, general machine learning template. Another, one problem with this approach is that this third step, projecting to an output of vocabulary, is very computationally intensive. Especially if you're gonna process a lot of text. So we need a better, higher performance way of doing this. And to do this, we can say, all right, let's split the problem into two problems. Let's say step one, we're gonna create high quality embeddings. And then step two, we're gonna worry about a language model that outputs the next word. And then step two, we can very conveniently ignore in this talk and only focus on, on number one because we want to, our goal is to generate high quality models. How can we do that? We can change the task from saying predict the neighboring word, take one word and then predict the neighboring word, to we'll give you two words. And the model should give us a score from zero to one saying, are they neighbors or not? So if they're neighbors, it would, the score would be one. If they're not neighbors, the score would be zero. If it's in between, it's in, it's in between. And so this model is much faster. It's no longer a new neural network. It becomes a uh, logistic regression problem. And you can train it on like millions of words in, in a few hours on a laptop. Uh, so there's a huge, tremendous performance boost there. A lot of these ideas come from this concept called NCE, noise contrastive estimation. And so these are some of the, some of the roots that you can um, you know, you see where a lot of these ideas bubbled up. If we're changing the task, we have to change our data set. So we no longer have uh, one feature and one label. We have two features, and then we have a label which is one, because all of these w words are neighbors. That's how we, we, we got them. But then this opens us up to a, a smart-ass model that would always return one. Actually, that's the definition of the entire model. It's return one, and that would be perfect accuracy. It would fit the data set incredibly, but it would generate terrible embeddings. So we can't have a data set of only positive examples. We have to challenge it a little bit. So we want to space out. You know, we didn't delete anything. We're just spacing out our examples, and we're saying, okay, we'll give you a challenge. We'll get, add some negative examples of words that are not neighbors. So for each positive example, we'll add, let's say, two, you can use five or ten uh, negative examples. And then, but what do we put here? What are words that we know are not neighbors? We can just randomly select those from our vocabulary. And so we randomly sample them. They are negative examples that were randomly sampled, so these are negative, this is negative sample. There's a little bit more detail that goes into, you know, you can count them, so you can uh, negatively sample words like a uh, or the that don't give you much information, but that's, that's a detail that you don't need to worry about now. With this, I'd like to welcome everybody to word to vec These are the two central ideas about, about word to vec that are being used right now in uh, recommendation systems. And these are the, the building blocks that we needed to establish before going into. Um... So to recap, if we have text, we have running text, we can slide a skip gram window against it. We can train a model, and then we'll end up with an embedding matrix containing embeddings of all the words that we know. By the same token, if we have a click session, if we have a user going around clicking on products on our website, we can use those or treat those as a sentence. We can skip gram against those, and we'd have embeddings for each item, each product that we have that we can use to do um, very interesting things. We'll get to that in a second, but 
An important thing to discuss when addressing embeddings is that they encode for the biases that are available in the text that you train them on. And so if we look at analogies, man is to doctor is as woman is to, what would the model output here? Nurse. Nurse, exactly. Um, and th so th this is a data set that was not trained on social media. Uh, this was trained on Wikipedia. These are like data sets that you wouldn't think um, would encode for, for bias to this level. And this is the same thing with uh, text that is in, uh, trained against uh, news articles. Uh, and so we can't blindly, this is something Martin hit also this morning, we can't blindly apply these algorithms. We have to, you know, we will figure out that there are problems. And a really good paper that addresses this and examines uh, these biases in, in word vectors and uh, gives examples about how we can de-bias them. And actually does a, a very interesting things of, of projecting words into a he versus uh, she plot and it tells you what, what um, uh, occupations are most associated with she versus he. Um, so highly uh, recommended reading uh, to know a little bit about, about the bias that is encoded without thinking uh, in these models. With that, we have completed our introduction about NLP and we can start talking about using word embeddings in other uh, domains. So Airbnb have this incredible paper. I have a link in the end. Um, they say, you know, Airbnb, I'm sure you know, is a website where you can go and book a place to stay. Say a user visits the Airbnb homepage um, and you record that in your, let's say, uh, in your log. Um, they visit a listing. And then they go do a site search. They go, you know, search London or something. And they search another list. They click on another listing and then another one. We can delete everything that's not a listing from this click uh, stream, let's say, or click session. And we can do that with a number of our users. Uh, and this paper has done this with, I think, 180 million click sessions. And then we can treat those as sentences. Because when these, the assumption here is that these users encoded for a specific pattern that they were looking at when they were browsing these uh, <coughs> listings in succession. So how do we extract that sort of pattern out of, out of these listings? Skip gram. We treat them as sentences. We skip gram against them. We create our positive examples. We get negative samples from randomly from, from the other listings. And voila, we have an embedding for each listing that we have on our site. Now, the next time a user visited list, visit, visits listing number three, we can say, OK, we have the embedding of listing number three. We can just multiply that with this entire matrix. And that would result in the scores, the similarity scores of each vector, each listing to listing number three. And so we can easily generate a list of most similar listings. And we can just show them to the user, and that would show up on, on, on the product. They go one step further. They go actually a few steps further, but we're going to talk about two. Um, so let's say we've shown these three uh, recommendations to the user. And they clicked on the first two, but they didn't click on the third one. Is there a signal here that we can extract from this interaction to improve our model? What they do is they said, OK, this one that was not clicked, we'll add that as a negative example. And so when we're training our, doing our skip gram word to vec model, uh, we'd know to space the, the embedding for listing number three a little bit farther from the listing for one, three, four, five. And so that feeds the, the model. You can continue uh, training it using this um, uh, example. And I, and I really, uh, one of the things that really stand out to me in this paper is that they use the word to, to VEC terminology and, and tools to actually improve it. Um, this is another one. This is another great one. So you have click sessions. Let's say the first two users have not, uh, did not book anything. They just visited one uh, number of, of listings, one after the other. But the last one did. And they booked that, uh, that last uh, listing, number 1,200. Is that a signal? Can, that, can we encode that in how we embed our, our, our listings? And 
what they propose is that, okay, when we're doing the skip gram, we need to include that finally, that ultimately booked listing as a positive example in every uh, window that we slide, even if it was outside of the context. So for this one session that, was, that ended up in the, in the booking, uh, let's associate every listing that the user saw with, with this last one. And so when we you know, do the skip gram for the first one, listing 1200 is there as a positive example. And then when we slide it, it's also there. So it's a, like a global context. This is the paper, it's, it's tremendous. The first author has have been thinking about this since his time in, in Yahoo. He's, he's been writing um, uh, about using word to vector as in, in recommendations for, for, for a long time. Uh, so highly, highly recommended reading. Uh, they showcase some of their uh, results. So they say they have this tool. They say you give it a, the ID of a listing. So they chose this treehouse. And when they search for it, the tool based on this method actually gave a number of other tree houses. It, they rolled it into production because it improved their click-through rate of, of uh, similar listings by about 21%. And Airbnb is, is pretty sophisticated when it comes to this stuff. So what they were using before is not something that was you know, simple. or um, So I think that this really counts, counts for something. A couple of more ideas that we don't have enough time to get into is that they, um, they find a way to project both users and listings in the same embedding space. So you can choose a, a user and then you can find the, the, the closest listings or other users to them. And so you can really start bending space with these, with these concepts. Another uh, example we can think about, which is kind of similar, but it starts from a different place, is uh, Alibaba. Alibaba has one of the, maybe the largest marketplaces um, on the planet where consumers can sell to other consumers. Uh, it's, it's called Taobao, I believe. Um, and if you have you know, millions or hundreds of millions of products, you can't expect people to just browse through them. You really need to rely on, on recommendations and that the majority of their sales are accounted for by recommendations and, and, and views. So how do they do that? They start with the click sessions, but they don't skip gram on them. They do something else. They say, okay, let's build a graph. Let's take the first two. Each one would be a, uh, a node, and we'd have a, a directed sort of edge between them. And then let's take the second uh, you know, pair, and then we have a, an additional uh, node there with an edge. And then go with the second user, do the same, it goes back, and then you can see the weight. So this is a weighted uh, graph that says how each item is, is a node, and it tells you how, how they're, they're connected. And so by the end, you do this with all of your users. You end up with a, a giant graph of how all of your items are connected and which ones are sort of, you know, lead in, in their traffic leads to other items. When you have this graph, you can do a graph, what's called a graph embedding, which would be to say, okay, one of, there are a number of ways to do it, but one of the ways, which is the one they use, is called the random walk. So let's randomly select a, uh, a node in the network, let's say 100. Uh, let's look at the outgoing uh, edges from there by using their weights and choose a, one to go visit. And we go visit that one, would be 400. And then the same, and then we stop at some point. And so that's one sequence. Let's pick another node randomly. And then we do this entire thing again. And so we generate sequences like this, just doing random walks, and that's a way to read and encode for the structure of this graph in, in a number of sequences. Now, what you do is you skip gram against this. And this, is, this was their, their approach. And then the rest is just the same. And you, then you would end up with, with item uh, embeddings and you can use for recommendations. They also go for a couple more steps. So they tell you how to use side information to inform these embeddings. So how can you use the description maybe of an item to influence an embedding? Uh, so, you know, a couple of really cool ideas in there. The third, I think, and, and final example here um, comes from uh, ASOS, the, the fashion uh, retailer. And I believe some students in Imperial, Imperial College here in, in, in London. 
And they use embeddings to calculate uh, customer lifetime values. The, they already have a system to calculate customer lifetime value, but it works on uh, a lot of features that were hand created by data scientists. Uh, but they had a hunch. They're like, okay, customers with high lifetime values, they have a hypothesis that they would visit similar uh, items at similar times. And customers with low lifetime value visit maybe altogether on sales or when a product is cheaper at the site than it is on the outside. And it's very hard to sort of come up with a handcrafted way to capture that sort of information. So what they've done is they said, okay, and look, they're laying the, the, the data a little bit differently here. So they say for each item, what is the sequence of users who have accessed that item's page or screen on an app? So this is no longer a click session. This is a users who have visited this item. And they do this with, with all their items. And then they would script, skip gram against the, these users. And then you'd have an embedding for each user. And then that's just one uh, feature that they add, they give to, to their model. And this is the, uh, the paper. There are a couple more examples. We don't have enough time, unfortunately, to, to get into them. But there are a couple in, in music rec recommendations. Uh, Angami, the music streaming service, uh, you know, has a great blog post uh, about how, how, how they do that for music recommendations. Spotify, there's a, a presentation from, I think, 2015, where they mention, so they would use, a lot of these shops would use ensembles and a number of different methodologies, but they would use this one uh, to inform their related artists. So you'd have, you know, playlists that were created by users. You can skip gram against these and you'd have related artists. Uh, but they also use it for uh, radio. When you use Spotify and you use a, you know, uh, click a uh, artist radio or a genre radio, they use this kind of method uh, with a bunch of others as well. If you want to go into the nitty gritty and understand the, 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 the probability and maybe some of the uh, statistics that go behind this, these, these were some of the best resources I was able to, to find and, and get. Uh, the Jurafsky book, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that right, is available for free online. It's just PDF. It goes into n-grams and language models. It goes into word to vec uh, And then uh, Goldberg's book is relatively new. I also found it to be very accessible. Uh, Chris McCormick has an incredible blog post that talk about word to vec in general, but also talks about word to vec for product recommendations. I wouldn't be doing the Dune uh, theme uh, service if I ended without talking about consequences. Dune was, was published on 1965. Um, and at that time, it was this Wikipedia quote um, says that it really had people start to think about the environment because they really started to think about the planet as one system where everything is, 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 is connected. And they call it the first it was called the first planetary ecology novel on a grand scale. I looked for, you know, it says the first images of Earth from space. I think it's the first colored images from space. Like we had things in black and white, but this is the first one that rolled in, I think, 1967, which led people to start thinking about the planet and, and, and the environment in a different way. When we think about recommendation systems, they're, they're pretty cool, right? They recommend films and movies. But you know, we can also joke about you know, Amazon recommendations. Uh, but you have to stop to think. So you know that people watch one billion hours on YouTube every day. And do you know that 70% of what they watch on YouTube is recommended by their algorithms? What does that mean? Humanity watches 700 million hours of video every day that were recommended by a recommendation algorithm. Algotransparency.org um, discusses a lot of this. It was, it's, you know, a, 
an organization run by a, a previous YouTube uh, engineer that worked on these recommendations and sort of um, talk about the effect and how, how to monitor them, I guess. So 700 million is, is a ridiculous number. You know, we have no context of what that is. We need to pull in like an Al Gore type thing to see. Uh, so okay, television was invented 92 years ago. Telephone 140 years ago. Printing press 500 years ago. Earliest human writings 5,000. Agricultural revolution was 12,000 years ago. Behavioral modernity, which is when humans started burying their dead uh, and wearing animal hides, was 52,000 years ago. 700 million hours of video is about 80,000 years. That's how much YouTube we watch every day. To put that into, into context as well, you know, two-thirds of, of American adults get their news and information from social media. And that fits into recommendation engines because a lot of these algorithmic feeds are recommendation engines. They recommend content to you that is relevant to you. And so there are a number of ways that you can think about this as harmful. One of the ways that I was able to sort of find an example of is the World Health Organization warned that the cases of measles have increased by 50% last year. 136,000 people have died from the measles last year. So the trend is going upwards, right? And they, they attribute the problem to a number of things, but this is happening all over the world, even in Europe. And they attribute it, uh, one of the reasons is uh, misinformation on social media. So it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that, you know, at this point in time, recommendation engines are a, a life and death matter. Facebook wrote this blog post about some of their thinking and what they're doing to, to combat a lot of this with elections, with a number of different axes. One of the interesting highlights in that, in that blog post is this figure. They said, okay, think about the different axes of uh, you know, uh, content that can generate harm. Racist content, terrorism content, misinformation of any kind. They say if there's a policy line of where that content gets banned, the closer the content approaches it, the more people would engage with it. So let, to, to look at this, let's say this is maybe a racism axis where very harmless talk about race is on, the, on one side and then calls for genocide are on the other side. So you can draw the line here, you can draw the line here or here. It depends on you know, each, each case. But the, the weird thing is that wherever you draw the line, engagement, human engagement just shoots up wherever you put it. It's, it's incredible. Now, we've never you know, thought about this before you know, uh, learning about this. And when you think about this, so okay, we're training our models on data. If we're training our model on engagement data, we're encoding, we're telling them to push people towards borderline content. And it is insane that we just blindly throw data, engagement data specifically, at, at um, you know, these recommendation models that are dealing with content and information. And this is just a recent realization. This post was November, December. So we're really trying to figure out these systems. We have, we're really um, you know, feeling the, the, the space. What they're, what they're thinking about is that, okay, when content approaches the line, they need to start demoting it and recommending it less. How does that work? Let's say this is the racism access. So we know that engagement shoots up when there's a policy line. When we know that content, either through a machine learning algorithms that flag content or through human moderators, when we have identified something that's on the right side of that line, we remove that content. So there's no engagement. But then that's, in, that's not enough, is what Facebook is saying. They're saying there needs to be another line to tell where borderline content is. So we need to train machine learning models that, and, and I guess people that are able to find borderline content. But then what do we do with them? We just don't recommend them. We demote them. We don't have to take them off the platform because if, you know, they're not illegal or against the, the policy, but you know, we're not gonna recommend them. Just about a month ago, YouTube are, saying, are doing the same thing. And so that's one of the, the ideas that we're adapting to uh, do um, these recommendation models. So they're like, okay, things, you know, false claims 
or phony miracles or uh, claiming the you know, Earth is flat, we're going to demote videos like this. They say this kind of content accounts for about 1% of what's on YouTube, which is a good percentage. That's 7 million hours of video a day. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we're, we're figuring this out. You know, it's, it's, it's a little weird because this is not what we signed up for when we go into, you know, software. We don't think about, you know, genocide and, and freedom of speech on the other angle. Uh, but there's an actual saying that software is eating the world. Um, and with that, software become, problems become planet-wide problems. That's why one of the, my favorite examples, and I close with this, is Full Fact, which is a UK-based fact-checking charity. So they have people who fact-check the news, but they also develop technology to do that. They've partnered with Facebook in the beginning of the year to fact-check a lot of the content on there. They have a great uh, talk about one of the ways that they're using to automate fact-checking. I can summarize how it does it in one word for you. Embeddings. Thank you very much.